diversity and inclusion coordinator for DCBS, bowling and construction uh, contractor board. And I want to welcome everybody. Travis White is going to be the introduction of the speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking a few moments out of your guys' normal lunch schedule to come and hang out with all of us. Um, this is uh, our normal lunch and learn schedule for uh, the African American Heritage Month. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what else to bring up here. It is, of course, brought up by our Diversity and Inclusion Council, which is part of the Diversity and Inclusion Initiative here at DCBS. Um, I apologize, I've memorized your names, but in different orders, so I might hold <laughs> off here a little bit. Um, but here we have uh, Dr. Ren Reginald Richardson. I have so much trouble with that first name. That's okay. <laughs> you got um, it. He is uh, the executive director of the Alcohol and Drug Enforcement, uh, excuse me, Policy Commission. Yes. Um, and then we have uh, Pastor, sorry, uh, Marilyn Williams, uh, who's the former secretary of the NAACP and also the, I'm sorry, was it the leader or? The chairman. Chairman, sorry, of the African American Youth Leadership Conference. We have uh, Cynthia Richardson, who is the director of student equity, access, and Sorry, advancement uh, for Salem Kaiser Public Schools, and at the end we have uh, Joel Payton, who is our reinsurance program manager with the Department of Financial Regulation. So we have a, a set of prepared questions that they have already um, with them, and I'll be asking them uh, each of the four questions, and we'll give each of them a chance to respond. And then at the very end, there'll be a, an opportunity for you all to answer your own questions as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and start. Um, I'll direct it right to you, Reginald. Uh, what is your career story, and uh, what are your challenge? What are the challenges uh, you have faced with respect to diversity during your career? <clears throat> um, my career story. It all began on a summer day back in night. No. Um, <laughs> Can you hear me okay if I don't use the mic, or do I need to use the mic? Use the mic. It's being recorded now. Oh, okay. So I have to take this more seriously. All right. I have been uh, in Oregon for the last three and a half years. Uh, I came here from uh, Chicago um, to run the self-sufficiency program with the Department of Human Services after a national-wide search. Um, and I came here uh, really to work on anti-poverty issues. I have a background in a family and children's mental health. Um, and in my uh, work for a number of years, what we kept bumping up against was that you could provide lots of different kinds of services, but until you really address poverty, you didn't really get to all the issues that you needed to get to. So I was very excited about the opportunity to come here to Oregon. But I have to say, Oregon wasn't really on my radar. I knew where it was, which was more than most people that I talked to in Chicago, um, but it wasn't something that I was really looking forward to, to coming until actually my wife found the job and encouraged me to uh, apply for it. Um, when I was at, uh, in Chicago, I was the vice president for, um, uh, now I forgot my title, vice president for evaluation and clinical services at the Family Institute where I had a both an academic and administrative appointment. And I was quite comfortable in that job. I had been there for 17 years and thought I would die there and they'd have to take the keys from my cold, dead hands. But my wife had a different idea. She wanted us to, to have an adventure, being 50 plus, to move across the country to Oregon. And so um, we did that. And um, I was with DHS uh, with the job I just described to you. And then through a confluence of of situations, uh, changes in administration, uh, I became the deputy director. Uh, for the, my tenure there, I had uh, more jobs than I could count. Um, I didn't understand in state service you could actually say no. And so when I get asked to do different things, I would say yes. And so that's, I think, how I got uh, into that role. And then this past um, May, the governor asked if I would uh, join the Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission to really um, move her agenda forward on 
working on substance use disorder issues, and so I've been doing that since May. Uh, so I'm still new, three and a half years later, still trying to understand the culture of Oregon and how do we do things that we do here and how to make a impact. Um, when I'm not uh, working, I, I have the privilege of serving as uh, vice president of the NAACP. I'm also on the board of trustees for Warner Pacific University. Uh, and I have the uh, privilege of being the husband of my beautiful uh, bride. Uh, of just 30 uh, some years. Um, so we're still working, we're still new at that. We have uh, three uh, adult sons uh, and a host of uh, grandchildren. So that's my more, probably more than what you wanted to hear. Um, there's another part of the question which was <clears throat> uh, my career story and then the challenges. I think uh, my challenges are not unique to, I think, most African Americans. And that is, I have been in situations because of, uh, you know, the society in which we live in, uh, we face racism and institutionalized racism, which means there are assumptions made before I ever open my mouth or before I ever come into uh, to get to know anyone about who I am and what I'm all about. And so that has impact on career pathways, opportunities. I've worked for lots of different organizations in the human service arena. I've been passed by in terms of promotion. Um, uh, I've experienced because of, I think, lots of different things. I won't go into that at the moment. Um, fear, um, what I've experienced uh, here in Oregon is that um, our Caucasian brothers and sisters don't like being told what to do by people of color. Um, and that's just a fact, and that makes it very hard when you're running large organizations and tra making uh, culture change. Um, so, I, but again, I don't think that's a, a different experience than I think most African Americans have uh, in not only this area, but uh, across the country, given the nature and places that we work and live. Um, the final thing I'll just say in terms of my own pathway is that uh, I sit here today with a PhD. And I have a PhD because I wanted to be the best and most highly qualified person in my, in my field of endeavor. And the reason why I did that is because it became clear to me that I could be competing against someone who just uh, have little, little experience, no education, and we can compete. That doesn't seem quite right, but that's how it is. And I have found that to be more true here than any place I've ever been. Uh, education isn't really valued as much here in Oregon as I would like. We see that by the rates of graduation um, in, in our public schools. So I'll stop there because I know we only have 10 minutes and I probably have already wasted all of that. I appreciate so it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Reginald. And uh, let's go ahead and move on over to uh, Pastor Marilyn Williams, if you wouldn't mind as well. Same question. OK. Um, my career story, it, it began when I was a little girl age nine years uh, old, um, church, um, when I saw the second supreme basilisk for the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Her name was Lorraine Green, and she spoke about how important education was for young black women, young black girls, and she talked about the PhD program that all young women should be striving for in their lifetime to become a doctor. And that's when I learned that a doctor wasn't just an MD. A doctor can be uh, anyone from any type of career field that they chose. With seeing her, listening to her, that put me on the track as that's what I want to do. That's what I want to have. And so many years later, I became a school teacher. And my love for books, my love for working with young children, especially children that people put down and call those kids. Mm. I made them my kids because they're not those kids. Those kids, and I hate people when they say that, not to say, hey, I should say I dislike. I dislike when people say those kids. Those kids range from children of color to majority children. And those kids are the ones that people tend to throw away and put negativism in those lives. And I am here to say, no, nope, there's nothing negative about you. There's a lot of positive things going about you. 
You didn't ask to be born. You didn't ask to come here. But now that you have walked through those school doors, I am going to make sure that you have everything you need when you walk out of my classroom. Notice I said my classroom, because all those kids became mine, whether it was white, black, Hispanic, Asian, you name them, I taught them all and showed them all how to be respectful of each other. You see, hate is something that people learn. Love is something else that people love. And many times teachers can change a child's life from worse to the best. Um, I have seen children who from the age of six have a, what we would say a criminal record and was told that they would never be anybody and never grow up to be anything. And I have turned those same young children and said, you can be anything you want to be. I still stand on that endeavor. And I have been teaching kids from Chicago, Illinois to Rockford, Illinois, and came out here to Oregon. And I remember um, once I became a teacher, I wanted more. I wanted to become a administrator because I wanted to be able to change some policies that I saw that was unfair for many of the children in the classrooms. I wanted to change minds. So I became an administrator, um, went back to school, and got my master's degree, and began to change lives for special ed students because they was the outcasts. And those were kids, as they would call them, and made them see that you're just as good as anybody else. There's nothing wrong with you. You can do it. And I worked very hard to work with those students and work with those students because they were my students to the point I have a beautiful Juju 500-piece um, puzzle hanging in my garage with the kids autographed, signing that they all came together to put that puzzle together. And some of them had some real hard um, issues, but they were able to work together, and it taught them that they could do anything they want to do. And so fast forwarding to Oregon, I came to Oregon because I was um, invited for a job interview, not only in Salem-Kaiser, but in Eugene. And I remember going back telling my husband, you know, I really like Oregon. If they offer me a job, I'm going to take it. And I remember my husband's reply, we have a job here. I have a job here in Illinois. I live here in Illinois. I was born in Chicago. I was raised in Chicago. I'm going to die in Chicago. <laughs> and I told him, I was born in Chicago. I was raised in Chicago, but I can die anywhere. I don't have to die here. So I'm moving to Oregon. Needless to say, screaming and pulling, he made it out here to Oregon. And now he's the president of the NAACP. And so he's glad he's made that move. We're both happy that we made the move. And we're still working to change people's minds, help change people's lives, and help change the ideas that racism have. Um, there's many stories. That the, mine is just one story. But there's many stories. And too many times, we as a people go by the stereotypes that we see on television. We go by the stereotypes that we have learned through racism. And it's not that way. And we need to open our minds and realize that we are all the same. We all bleed red. We don't bleed green, yellow, blue. We are all come from the same thing. We're all human beings. And one person is not better than anyone else. So thereby, being a teacher, I'm still teaching. Being a pastor, I'm still pastoring. Um, and I still run up against racism, gender race, um, uh, discrimination because in many walks of the religion area it is unbiblical for a woman to be a pastor and I'm here to say hogwash you need to get into your Bible <laughs> and see that women have just as much important part in religion and um, Jesus Christ made that to be known so um, I'm still teaching I'm still here I'm still fighting and um, diversity, I grew up in diversity. I grew up in a Chicago neighborhood watching it being torn to pieces 
from where you had Greeks, Italians, Jews, Chinese, Hispanics, or known as Latino X, African Americans, all in one neighborhood growing up with each other, only to watch um, the city of Chicago divide those neighborhoods to where you had the Pilsen area, Little Italy, the Greeks moved all the way out to the suburbs, the Italians moved other places, and so you had Circle Campus take over, um, you had the Medical Center take over, and you had just a little small section of people who stayed and they had to fight. So what is diversity? Diversity is when you have people of all color, walks, likes, um, sexual orientation, you name it, to be able to get along with each other and recognize we are all human beings and we need to be respectful of each other. That's what I'm all about. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll ask the same question of you as well, Cynthia. Wow. I was very blessed and fortunate to be born into a family of educators. My uh, grandparents, my parents were teachers. Uh, came from Tyler, Texas. Um, this is my 39th year as an educator, so it was that many years ago before I entered into the field. Um, I knew I wanted to um, help, I used to say, my people. I wanted to become an educator so that I could make a difference in the lives of others. I have uh, been a high school teacher. I've been a high school assistant principal. I've been um, the first African-American um, elementary principal in Lancaster, Texas. I uh, was recruited from Lancaster, Texas to Lincoln, Nebraska. That was never in my um, journey, uh, but I was convinced to go to Lincoln, Nebraska to try to make a difference for uh, kids there and the diversity that they were experience, experiencing with the Catholic Community Services. Um, coming from Texas to Nebraska, trying to adjust to the snow, not a good idea. At that time, I was married to Prince Richardson, who was a mail carrier for the Postal Service. It's definitely not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, stayed there two years, was recruiting for Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, Salem Kaiser was at the same recruiting fair. And at the end of that evening, I was asked to go to dinner with them. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm here by myself. I'll be more than happy to go to dinner with you. And it was obvious once we went to dinner <laughs> that they had a different objective. <laughs> it was, you know, we've been watching you all day, and we'd love to have you in Salem, Oregon. What would it take to get you? I said, Oregon, what is Oregon? <laughs> I'm like, I heard there weren't any black people in Oregon. <laughs> of course, one of the ladies that was recruiting me was African American, so. Um, I knew that, yeah, there was a possibility that there might be some African Americans here. But they worked on me a whole year. I mean, they would not, they just kept calling, kept sending letters, kept inviting me out. Uh, and so finally I came, uh, took one of their invitations, ended up going to New Mexico, where I met the superintendent then, who was Homer Kearns. And um, he just really sold Salem Kaiser. Uh, with his goals, his desires, and, and how he wanted to make a difference for the students here. And so I came out, um, interviewed, um, ended up at McKay High School as an assistant principal, uh, stayed in that position two years, ended up going to Adam Stevens Middle School as an assistant principal, became principal there three years, and then uh, became principal of North, of, excuse me, McKay High School seven years, and then North Salem High School, seven years. So this is my 39th year. This is my second year in the district office as Director of Student Equity Access and Advancement. And I am truly, truly uh, seeing my purpose. I thought in my schools um, that was truly my purpose. But in the district office position, I'm able to reach out to kids all across the district and not just in schools. And we have a lot of schools, a lot of students who need to know that somebody cares about them, that they can be and do anything they want to do and be, uh, not to give up on themselves, not to allow others to give up on them. Um, I'm the first African-American high school um, principal in Salem-Kaiser. 
And I just remember when I walked into McKay High School, the kids would look at me and say, you're my principal? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, and you can be a principal and much more. Kids in Salem, when I first came here, the experience was they did not believe. They had been oppressed. Um, and, and it's something that we're still fighting in the schools because uh, our teachers are predominantly white. Many of them have not had experiences with people of color. And based on their experiences and the history and what they've learned, uh, they don't believe our kids can learn. So as an African-American administrator, you're constantly having to open doors for students. You're constantly having to advocate for students. You're constantly having to just give them a chance, give them an opportunity, and let's see. One of the programs we embraced at North Salem High School was Equal Opportunity Schools. And during that process, instead of teachers being able to make recommendations for students to be in AP classes, this company comes in and they do an assessment which determines if you have the grit and the determination and what it takes to be successful. It doesn't look at your uh, past grades or your attendance rate or your discipline record or any of that. And so once I'm told that I can be somebody and I can do something, when my growth mind set changes, and I see that somebody believes in me. By the time I left North Salem, there were over 500 students of color in AP classes. And that's what has to happen. Students have to know that they can learn and they can be successful. And we need people to believe that they can. So we need a lot of culturally relevant training in our schools. I'm not Dr. Richardson's wife, but I was fortunate to hire his wife, Helen Richardson, uh, to be an instructional coach at North Salem High School. And, and that's what you have to do. You have to hire people that look like the students uh, so that the students know that they too can have success. When they don't see role models that look like them, they don't believe they can achieve or can be anything they want to be. So I'm here. I, when I landed here, I came in August of um, 97. By um, November of 97, I was diagnosed with fourth stage breast cancer, um, had a radical mastectomy. My mother died in December. The doctor told me I couldn't go. I said, you and what army are going to stop me from going to Texas? Um, I was able to go and bury my mother, come back, take chemo and radiation, um, never lost weight, never lost my hair. Um, and in a few months, the doctor looked at me and he said, Mrs. Richardson, you are healed. So I know that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I know that that was his way of making sure I stayed here to do what he called me here to do. Amen. Amen. <laughs> thank you very much for sharing. And we'll take a last one over here to Joel. Sure. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, this is a really good opportunity for me to uh, really to give you a, a window to how my career ended up here at the Division of Financial Regulation. So when I come to my career story, I have to go right to my mother and my father. My dad, he was a mechanic, baseball all his life. My mother, she cleaned banks at night. We had six children. And I was the last child, the youngest. Mm -hmm. So I always looked, and I didn't, I didn't really ever see any type of inspiration from any of my siblings because usually, culturally, people, the children do what their parents are doing. So my oldest brother had a mundane career, my sister, my other brother, my other brother. And I'm like, no one's, no one's really achieving their, their full potential. So the reason why I want to use my mother, because, in, and I want to use a little bit of diversity in here. My mother's background is she's a Cherokee Indian, and she's, and she's a Dutch. My father's African American. So I was always used to being looked at weird when all of my brothers and sisters were all really light-skinned, and I'm the only dark child in the whole entire family. So I was even quoted as being like, you know, are you sure you're, what the, are that's your brother? Yes, my brother, like, he don't look anything like you. I'm like, you know what? 
Using that inspiration, I was like, okay, since I'm so different, when I graduate from high school, I'm going to pursue college. So I did. So I'm using this as a basis of, of how I, I'm where I, where I am right now because I never accepted norms because I knew that I could always be better or do better if I had opportunities to do it. And thankfully, you know, in, we're here in, in the United States of America, opportunity is always around us. But it, the question is, do you believe, and, and I'm piggybacking off of you, do you believe you have that opportunity? Can you actually have people tell you that you really can't do something or can't be somebody, but how is that even possible when you're in the most powerful country in the world and people can come whatever you want to be, but your choice is to be a thief or, you know, make really bad decisions in your life that keep you from pursuing your goals. So I didn't want any of that. My mom was my biggest inspiration because every night when I used to go help her, I think I was at age six or seven, go clean banks, I was like, there's no way I can do this. There's just no way I can do this. Absolutely not. So my, when I graduated from the University of Buffalo, upstate New York, Division I, where my basketball team is 17th in the nation, so there you go. <laughs> We're 17, we're going to the, uh, this, the, the, the tournament in March. But um, that was my goal. And when I graduated, I graduated with a, with a degree in early childhood development. And I pursued that. But then, in the upstate New York and Buffalo, I was working out of a, I was interning at a charter school. And the children, I'm bringing back bad memories, I'm sorry. Just give me a second. <laughs> the children of those communities were so disenfranchised. It's, I was like, what can I do to help these children? And I was just interning. But their, their economical and social structure had become, had become a norm. It was OK to, to be teaching children from textbooks that were 25 years old. That was OK, because that's all the, their charter school could afford. It was OK to have subpar teachers. It was OK for me to walk in the classroom and hear a teacher cursing at children. I'm like, what is going on? This is not what I signed up for. I mean, this is it. This is, this, this is the expectation of our children today. So my career really comes from the fact that I never wanted to accept it, any norm. So what I did every day when I went to that charter school, I always wore my University of Buffalo jersey. So those kids can see that it's possible for you not to accept this, but have the same outlook that I had when I was a child, when I was a seven-year-old child with my mother cleaning banks. You can do so much better. Because someone's right there in front of you showing you that it can be achieved. And one of the little, like I think it was an eighth grade student, I was teaching eighth grade math, and they were saying, wow, you go to college? I said, yeah, I do. I do. And I hope you do, too. So as far as my career, I'm going to jump start it real, real, real quick. Um, I came from Phil um, New York, upstate New York, and I worked in Philadelphia. I, I, did, uh, I was a traveling manager for the, uh, the travel centers that are, that are around the country. I, 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 I worked in uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Delaware, Utah, Idaho, South Dakota, and, yeah, in New Jersey, in New Jersey, right. So my experience with, with my career comes to, I guess I can use South Dakota at, 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 as a focal point of how I knew that America still had a lot of healing to do when it comes to diversity. I was at the counter taking care of a customer and a white gentleman, he was just staring at me. Remember, I'm in South Dakota now. He's just staring at me. And I'm looking at this gentleman and say, sir, can I help you? He's just laughing, he looked giggle. I was like, OK. Still, looked over two minutes later, he's still looking at me, staring at me. And then one of the customers just looked at him and said, what are you doing? Oh, I just want to see who's going to do. You, you, you know those type. I'm just, I just want to see what he wants, wants to do. And I'm like, I don't understand. So. 
as the gentleman finally left after trying to antagonize me, I walk around, I see his little card just say, our next Ku Klux Klan meeting is at 30, 3 o'clock. Mm. And I'm like, wow. We have a lot of healing to do. That gentleman didn't know my story. Actually, the gentleman didn't know me at all. He didn't know I come from a mixed background. All he sees was something in his mind, a perception of what wasn't a norm to him. And sometimes you have to sit and wonder why we have to have these type of you know, seminars because we're still teaching as a country. Thankfully now, I'm here at the Division of Financial Regulation, but before them, just real quick, I came from the Oregon State Hospital, and I'm not a patient, I actually work there. <laughs> <laughs> I just say that real carefully, it's like, what? You no, know, I wasn't a patient, I actually worked there for four and a half years before I came here. Um, I worked with the, uh, uh, as a mental health therapist and a compliance officer for, for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services over there. So yeah, so that's how my, that's how my career had, had, had come. You know, actually, to me, it's a, it's a pinnacle. Because here, and I'm, I'm putting a pitch in for the Department of Consumer and Business Services. Their attention to detail when it comes to diversity is something that I've never experienced in my entire life. It actually works in this division, at this department. It's amazing. It's not just sub-level management. It's upper-level management in all forms something that you like never really seen before. And it's like this DCBS is almost like a, is a subset of what this country really sh can be. Every race should have an opportunity to show their talent, not based on their color, but based on their ability to serve. And we're all public servants here. And we're actually doing our best to serve our public. Why should that be based on any, the shade of your skin? at all. So that's why I'm, I, I agreed to come to this panel today, just to tell you my story, that yes, there are both highs and lows in this country when it comes to trying to you know, progress yourself, not become part of the strain by winding up in prison, you know, not that, but actually contributing because you're, not, you're American, because you belong to this country and doing what you have to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. And for everybody. Uh, we'll return back to you, Dr. Richardson, um, for the next question. Uh, what are common misconceptions that people have about African Americans, and how can we combat those misconceptions? You know, this question um, vexed me. Um, it's not my responsibility to address the misconceptions, the persons who have misconceptions. It's, it's tantamount to asking an assault victim what they could have done differently. If you've got misconceptions, go get educated so that you don't have them anymore. So I, I'm not, I don't want to play. I think it's inappropriate. Um, and you know, I've been African American for all my life and I'm done teaching. Um, I encourage everyone to do their own work. Um, and so, yeah, I'll stop there. I'll appreciate your uh, commitment to coming here to teach us regardless. Thank you very much. Well, let me just say thank you for saying that. I'm, I'm not actually here to teach you. I'm, I'm engaging in a process with you as we get to know one another. Uh, I think the, the way in which we make change systemically is through interaction. The United States of America has a uh, propensity to, to not want to have a conversation related to race yet it's in everything. You know, we, we tend to take the complex and we try to make it simplistic. The notion of, of opportunity is really a misnomer. There's opportunities for some and no opportunities for others. And to blame the victim, which is inherent in this question, is um, unfortunate, unfortunate. We have misconceptions and I think that we all have to do our own growth and development to work on those uh, misconceptions. Oregon happens to be a place that talks a lot about diversity and equity, more so than any other place I've ever been. Yet the proof, the outcome, isn't so much. And so although I appreciate this opportunity, 
I want to be very clear about where I stand with that. I'm not interested in, in changing your misconceptions. If you have them, do your own work. Thank uh, you, Dr. Richardson. Thank you. And we'll uh, take it over next to uh, Pastor Marilyn Williams. Okay. Um, the common misconceptions, I agree with um, Dr. Richardson. First of all, you people need to be educated. That's number one. They need to be educated. And so Oregon is full of um, implicit bias. I mean, you already have your misconception is already within you. So you need to educate yourself so that you can understand uh, about all types of people, especially um, African Americans. And when they say misconceptions, African Americans have to educate themselves as well about the majority of people, um, the white majority of people. Because any group you look at, you're going to have your misconception. But if you don't educate your own self and know what your own story is, then you have a problem. We do have a problem. The question should be is how do you define yourself? When you can define yourself, then you know who you are, what you are, what you're about, and what you're going to do, and how you're going to do it. Too many times we, um, as African Americans, have heard, well, you're not like the other ones. What do you mean we're not like the other ones? We are our own selves. We are our own people. So um, we need to change that, and people need to educate themselves and be willing to take on the difficult conversations of what is going on. They need to be willing to stop being in a state of denial, but realize, hey, I need to apologize because I'm wrong about a lot of things. If you want to talk about misconceptions, there is misconceptions all over the world. There is misconception in any country you go to. Because mm -hmm. you go to a foreign country, mm -hmm. the misconception of Americans is that we think that we are better than them. We have no respect for their culture or their customs or their rules. And so once again, we have to look at that and say, hey, we need to educate ourselves before we go to other people's countries demanding things that we shouldn't demand or say things that we shouldn't say. So the misconception about people, that goes hand in hand for everybody. And the big key is education. You need to educate yourself. You need to open your mind, clear your mind, and get rid of all the stereotype um, ideas and suggestions and cultural um, rhetoric that you have grown up with and look into the truth and find the true meaning, then thereby you will be able to def uh, uh, define who you are, what you are about, and what you plan to do about it, and how you can change and make changes to make things better for all people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Cynthia, we'll go to you next. What are the common misconceptions people have about African Americans? Uh, most people, the misconceptions they have are based on what they've seen in the newspaper, uh, on TV, uh, in the movies. Um, this idea that African Americans are less than, they're not good enough, they steal, um, they're not deserving. Um, and a prime example is when I finally decided to accept the position here in Salem, I was at Walmart. Uh, on Commercial Street and uh, shopping. And I come out to my car, and you know how you can feel people are coming towards you or around you? Mm -hmm. Five white men followed me out to my car. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, excuse me? Here's my purse. Here's my bags. <laughs> do whatever you need to do. I don't steal. Mm -hmm. That misconception that African Americans have to steal so each one of you have an opportunity to get to know someone of a different culture, to be that ally for that person of a different culture. And um, I speak up for myself, but it helps when you have other people around you that have the same beliefs and that can you know, say, you know, that wasn't right, or that's not OK. This is what we need to do. 
Each one of us have opportunities to help each other, to open doors for each other, and that's what we need to do. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Joel, we'll go to you as next. Well, when I think about that question, first of all, it, it is education. And even right now, we are combating those misconceptions right now by having this event. So I'm very grateful that you, that, that you decided to have this event and, and this, this open forum like this. But when you say a common misconception, I have to revert back to experience. And just like, um, what's, what's some doctor, what's your, what's your name? Richardson. Yeah, well, not her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Pastor Mayor. Yeah. Pastor Mayor, I'm sorry. When, 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 she, when she alluded to how misconceptions are global, they're not just, just because you're in America, you only hear of it. When you go to other countries, you hear even more of it. So my experience, and I know we're pressed for time, but it's real quick. I was at the University of Buffalo, and I was at the, um, I was the uh, at the time I was the president of the African Student Association. And one of the members of the association came up to me and said, you know, uh, Peyton, they call me Peyton in college. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be really honest with you. I was like, I don't understand, what, what, what do you mean? He says, you know, when I first came to this university, I didn't realize there were so many African Americans that went to college. I'm like, what? And she was from Nigeria, Africa. And I'm like, okay. See, mission exceptions are global. They are, they are what you see on TV, in the movies, in music, in advertisements, mm -hmm. and the little subset of you may see in your maybe your daily commute is really not what people of color really are. It is 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 shocking how we don't see the most the, the successful, you know, African Americans. They don't have to be popular, but just going into your neighborhood, you know, there's an African American family that lives there, or people of color that live there, and like, wow, look how nice their house looks, you know, other than you know graffiti, broken out windows, but that, cause that that's all that's all they've ever been shown. They're shocked. Oh, I didn't know you, were, you lived here. I got that in my own neighborhood. I didn't know you lived here. Oh, why? Because I don't have a brick through my, my, my door? <laughs> like, no. There's not a beaten down car or, 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 or broken out windows in front of my house? No. No, we, we, we here take advantage of our opportunities. So yes, a lot of those mis misconceptions are based on just pure education. You, and you as an individual, as an American, have to take it on your own self to learn um, about your about your culture and the people who, who live in your country. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. We'll return back to you, Dr. Richardson, uh, for the third question. Uh, what is one piece of practical advice that you would give to somebody starting out in a career in government? Um, determine whether or not the employment opportunity is your job or is it your career. I think that's a, a fundamental question you have to figure out. And then along with that is to know your why. Uh, the why is tied to what is your mission as a human being? Why has God created you to be here in this space and time? And then to find the work that fulfills that. Uh, I have worked with colleagues who are simply doing a job, and there's a quality associated with that. And I've worked with colleagues who it's their, their life mission, and there's a quality that's associated with that. And I think it's uh, more uh, productive and it's happier when you can find an opportunity that that propels you out of bed in the morning to go do that work uh, and whatever that may be and I think you've got to find that I think you also have to find opportunities to continue to learn prepare yourself for what you are doing today and then what you hope to do tomorrow um, as our economy is changing and the job structures are going to be changing We've got to be ahead of the game and thinking about what that's going to look like uh, in the future. And then strive to be your very best self, whatever that is, both professionally and personally. Because we spend so much of our time at work, uh, it makes sense not to do it in drudgery, to find the thing that turns you on and go do that thing and find a way to get paid for it. And then finally, I would just say, uh, um, Although my employer is the governor and I serve at her pleasure, um, ultimately who I serve is um, a god. That's 
for me, my faith tradition. And so whatever happens in my employment is less important to me as how God looks at how I do conduct myself and purport myself. Right? And I would just encourage people to find that for themselves, whatever it is, whether it's a, a faith-based uh, kind of uh, situation or something else, uh, but to live that, live that out. Many of us are, have employment opportunities where we are uh, public-facing. And what you do in interactions with your customers uh, often become what people think about people who are in state government. So I represent you and you represent me. So I beseech you, brethren, to <laughs> do your best at whatever it is you're doing. And I promise you I'll do my best as well. Amen. Thanks. Thank you, Romero. Thank you very much, Dr. Richardson. And uh, we'll go over to Pastor Marilyn Williams. Okay. Uh, one of my practical um, advice to anyone is I know when we start out we want a job because we have all these bills to pay but I would tell people when you're planning to get out to work find a job that you are happy doing it's, it doesn't make sense to work for an employer that you're not happy with because all you're going to do is complain 24 7 you don't want to get up in the morning you don't want to report in you really don't want to look at those people. And so why are you going? Because of the paycheck. That paycheck won't make you happy. It'll just make you push, and it's just barely adequate. Find something that you love and enjoy doing. Because when you enjoy doing where you're at, at the job that you're at, you'll find that you're much happier. You can smile. You can um, turn a good answer to people. And if people kind of rub you the wrong way, you know how to just kind of walk away and say, eh, they don't have it all. Forgive them and move on. But if you just take a job because you just have to, you're not really going to be happy. And when you look at a job, you want to look at to see where will this job take me? What goals do I have for myself? Will this job offer me those type of goals or the advancements that I'm looking for? You have to look at more than just one point. The paycheck may be great, but it may be, uh, it may be a dead-end job. Then what? You're there for six months or nine months, and then you have to, you're back out looking for something else. Look at what you do. Look what makes you really happy. And some folks may find that they're really happy working for themselves, not for the government, but you can become a consult consultant for the government and you may do an excellent job, but find what makes you happy. The second thing is you need to have some sort of faith base to keep you going because you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days. And you may get a supervisor that just rubs you no matter what you do, they rub you the wrong way, they're setting you up for the wrong thing, and you have to get to that point to say, you know what, I'm not working for you, but I'm working for the Almighty. And so what I do for the Almighty, he will bless me in what I do. And they may give you the worst job in the world that they think that you may fail, but if you're working for the Almighty, he's going to make your job become so much easier, and it's going to work out just right that it will blow your supervisor's mind. The other thing is when you plan to work for yourself or somebody else or another company, Make sure that that company has the right advancements. Make sure that company is offering you what you're looking for as far as education, as far as training is concerned, as far as workshops are concerned to help make you a better person. And last but, but not least, don't forget to smile. Please smile. It is easier to smile than to frown. Why? Because the more you frown, the more wrinkles you're going to have. But the more you smile, the less wrinkles you'll have. And so that is my advice to anyone. Start smiling. Thank you. That's some sound advice. Thank you very much, Pastor. <laughs> and uh, next we'll go over to Cynthia. Some practical advice you would give someone starting out. First of all, um, I know the plans I have for you. Yeah. So from the time you were born, uh, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, it was already determined who you would be and what you would be. Correct. So as you start uh, your walk and your talk and, and your journey, you, you know what that is. 
You know what makes you happy, where you find joy, where you find pleasure, where you find peace. If you can't sing your way to work every day and sing your way back home, you're in the wrong place. You're not doing mm. the right thing. Uh, you have to have that internal instinct that tells you that you are doing what it is you've been called to do. And you have to do it his way, not your way. His will, not your will. Uh, <laughs> Come on, preacher. You know, <laughs> Uh, the advice that was given to me when I came here, for example, I had already been a principal. I had to come here and accept an assistant principal position first, and then another assistant pr pr principal position at a middle school before I could get the position I wanted when I came here. And that's okay. Just don't give up. Mm -hmm. And just know that your journey may be different from somebody else's journey. We all don't get to the same place the same way at the same time. But oh, when you get there, mm -hmm. don't forget what you went through to get there and mm -hmm. pull up everybody else that needs to go with you to that next level. Remember, the people you step on to get where you're trying to go, when you fall, you're going to have to pass them. <laughs> so treat people the way you want to be treated. <clears throat> Love people the way you want to be loved. Include people the way you want to be included, regardless of their color, the color of their skin. My advice that was given to me was, come to Oregon, learn the culture before you try to lead the culture. And I will forever be thankful to the woman that told me to do that. Amen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cynthia. And uh, finally, we'll go over to you, Joel. Sure, and, and just for the sake of time, I'll be real quick. Um, very inspirational, all of you, really. Thank you very, very, very much for that. My practical advice, which actually always works for me, is whatever organization you go into, even, you, even when you're just starting off, you're going to need guidance. So the best opportunity is to find someone to mentor you. You know, cherish those relationships that you have that, that, that you do when you go into a new organization. And most importantly, learn how to cope. Whatever you do when you leave that office, if you pray to God, if you, if you run 20 miles, if you go fishing, you go hiking, do it, because you need the way you, you need to learn how to uh, to decompress and sort of refresh for the next day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. <laughs> so it looks like we're pretty pressed for time, so we might have to cut our questions for the group a little short. And we do still have one more left, and we have just enough time to maybe get through one person. So I wanted to see if any one of you wanted to answer the final question which is, what specific things can an organization do to ensure it makes the best use of a diverse workplace? Oh, I, can, I can take that. Go for it, Joe. So um, for me, it started off at, at college at the University of Buffalo, always being involved um, with diversity. You know, everyone who is involved with diversity, you are the champion of really of your own cause for others to follow. A lot of people, like I said, we, even though we discussed it earlier, people won't take the time to dispel those misconceptions of certain races. You know, here at the, the, the Department of Consumer and Business Services, even with this uh, in the diversity and inclusion group, that's a great way for people to actually learn about other cultures. Even though this month we're doing African American, but they've done Asian Pacific, they've, they've done Indian, you know, you know, it's just so many different cultures that they always capture and present to the community. So we can take that back. A, I've learned so much about those different cultures just by attending those events. So that's a really a great way, if you don't take the time to dispel those, to dispel those misconceptions, an organization is doing itself a favor by bringing to light those, those different cultures, you know, you know, throughout their organization and putting it on display and say, this is what the media says is not real. This is real. So that's the best thing an organization can do. And I want to invite everybody to the uh, Black History Program that will be held at McKay High School February the 28th at 7 o'clock p.m. Come see our students. They dance, they sing, they act. Um, come see them for yourself. It's February the 28th at 7 o'clock p.m. That's a Thursday night. We'll be marking our calendars. Thank you.
And uh, just a quick thank you for all of our panelists. Thank you for sharing your very powerful and uh, heartwarming, um, honestly, stories. And uh, thank you for your contributions to our community. It really does make a huge impact. And I think we'll leave it with just a final round of applause from everybody. Thank you.